Good evening. I'm Chris Brown, and I have the real privilege of serving as the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and welcome to our first Aviation Adventures Lecture of the Year. Thanks so much for joining us, whether you're here in our newly renovated planetarium or tuning in online. We appreciate you for taking the time to join us for this lecture. The Aviation Adventures Lecture Series spotlights all aspects of aviation, from military flight to record-setting feats to the humanitarian uses of aviation. This lecture series is the museum's longest-running sponsored program now in its 42nd year and remains sponsored by our good friends at GE Aerospace. I'd like to extend my personal and sincere thanks to GE Aerospace for their ongoing support of this lecture, which makes it possible for us to provide access to these programs free of charge, both in person and online. Joining us in the audience tonight are Darby Becker and Gina Zuckerman. Welcome, Darby and Gina, and thank you to, to you both, as well as your colleagues at GE Aerospace, for your support. I also want to encourage all of you to attend future Air and Space Museum events and lectures, including next month's Amelia Earhart Lecture in Aviation History, featuring U.S. Navy pilot and commercial airline captain Tammy Jo Schultz. It's taking place May 30th at our other location, the Stephen F. Udvar-Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia, and will be streamed on YouTube as well. You can visit our web website to sign up. But now, on to tonight's program. Sixty years ago today, Jerry Mock landed in Columbus, Ohio, completing a round-the-world flight and becoming the first woman to fly solo around the world. Her 23,000-mile journey lasted nearly a month and took her to incredible places that she had only dreamed of visiting before she hopped into her Cessna 180 determined to make her dreams a reality. While Jerry Mock is sadly no longer with us, tonight we are joined by two very special people who knew her quite well. Wendy Hollinger is a graphic designer and aviation enthusiast who worked with Mock to republish her book, 3-8 Charlie, with supplemental archival material. Shasta Ways is an Afghan-American aviator who completed a solo flight around the world in 2017. Jerry Mock was her mentor. Hollinger and Ways will be joined in conversation by Dorothy Cochran, our aeronautics curator here at the National Air and Space Museum. We're very fortunate to have Jerry Mock's Cessna 180, Spirit of Columbus, Columbus in the National Collection. It was displayed out at our Stephen F. udvar Hazy Center for many years until it was moved here to the museum in D.C. for display in our new Thomas W. Haas We All Fly Gallery. I hope you'll take some time after tonight's program to visit We All Fly and see Jerry Mox playing for yourself. We All Fly is just one of eight new and reimagined galleries that opened in 2022. These new galleries, the first phase of our ongoing transformation of all 20 galleries at this location, tell inspiring stories of flight in new ways to new audiences. I hope you'll come back soon to explore them all. Entrance to the museum is free, but timed entry passes are required. You can reserve yours on our website. All of this work by our museum, our new ex exhibitions, our lectures like this one, events like the Solar Eclipse Festival last week, our virtual educational activities, and more, is about showing our visitors that here at the National Air and Space Museum, there is space for everyone. Here's to anyone who's ever looked up. The airheads. And the space cases. Live long and prosper. The flight fanatics. The armchair astronauts. And the casually curious. 
Here's to those who know the thrust in Newtons of a Pratt & Whitney J75 turbojet engine. And those who silently ask, what's keeping this thing in the air? Here's to those who can list the name, mission history, and favorite breakfast of every Mercury astronaut. And those who've ever searched for, how does a toilet work in space? Here's to the people who knew a P-38 Lightning from a P-51 Mustang. And the people who thought those were the names of cars. Those captivated by the miracle of flight. And those who are just happy to make their flight. So whatever captures your curiosity. We choose to go to the moon. Or propels you to new heights. When it comes to the sky, there's space for all of us. Good evening and welcome. Tonight, we celebrate a special anniversary of the first solo round-the-world flight by a woman, and we honor all Earth rounders who have followed in this pilot's footsteps. Exactly 60 years ago today, Geraldine Jerry Mock touched down in her Cessna 180 at Port Columbus, Ohio Airport completing her record-setting circumnavigation of the Earth that began on March 19, 1964. In honor of her accomplishment, Mock received the Federal Aviation Agency's gold medal for exceptional service. In 1970, Mock published 38 Charlie, a candid account of her world flight, and everyone can learn more about her story on the museum website also at s.si.edu slash jerrymock. We just posted a new anniversary story yesterday, so be sure and check it out. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize a special member of the audience, Susan Reed, Jerry Mock's sister. Susan, we are so glad, so pleased to have you here with us tonight. Can we give her a little round of applause? Tonight's speakers have very different yet intertwined connections with Jerry Mock. When Wendy's reprint of Jerry's book came out, Shasta was still a student at Embry-Riddle getting her license. As a student, Shasta could not afford the cost of an original 3A Charlie book. She was delighted when Wendy republished it, giving her access and sparking the idea for a round-the-world flight. She contacted Wendy to say she was thinking of flying around the world. Could Wendy put her in touch with Jerry? Please welcome Wendy Hollinger and Shasta Weiss. Great to have you both here with us tonight. I'd like you both in your own way to tell us about your connection with Jerry Mock and who she was to you. Let's start with you, Wendy. You knew her a little bit earlier. Thanks, Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy, and thanks for having me. I was uh, first introduced to Jerry Mock in my local EAA chapter meeting by her sister, Susan. She came and told us the story of Jerry while she was working to raise money for a statue, and I was astounded that people right there in her own town, pilots, did not know her story and said, wow, we've got to fix this. Um, I published books and uh, asked to be put in touch with Jerry, and we flew to meet her in Quincy. It did not seem appropriate to arrive to meet Jerry in some other way other than flying there. Um, to be honest, she liked pilots better than regular people, so it was better to <coughs> smooth the ground that way. But it was just a uh, an honor to be able to meet her. We met her at the right time. Several people had talked to her about republishing her book, but we just happened to get her at the time that she was open to it, and she knew that it needed to go ahead and get done as she was uh, getting into her uh, later years. So we had the opportunity to work with her directly. We photographed all, uh, 825 pieces of her documentation and put a lot of that into the book, and through the publishing process and getting to know her, we were then blessed to 
to be able to be connected to people like Shasta and so many people that were inspired by Jerry's story and went on to be inspired further. Jerry's goal was always about um, spreading uh, the love of aviation and folks learning and pursuing their dreams. And so it was just really a, an honor to be a part of that with her and to work to carry on that, that vision as well. That's great. Yeah. Shasta. Well, thank you all for uh, being here, and thank you for inviting me. Um, my connection to Jerry is just so special, and it's the reason why I'm here today. Um, so originally, I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, my family came to America when I was just a baby. I grew up, English was my third language. I was not the brightest student uh, growing up. I um, struggled a lot with just understanding who I was, where I belonged. I wasn't sure if I belonged in Afghanistan or America. So it was a constant struggle. Um, but when I was 17 years old, I had the chance to fly uh, a commercial airliner, Delta Airlines, as a passenger in the very back, the middle seat, which is typically where people don't want to be, but that's where I was. And that's where I was inspired by aviation. Um, and what aviation really gave me was a sense of belonging. Um, I knew regardless of where I belonged, um, the sky was it for me. It just gave me so much, um, just like a sense of belonging. Um, so I got into aviation. I uh, eventually attended Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida. And I interned with a major airline where I got to jump seat a lot. And I quickly learned that I did not want to be an airline pilot. And I remember one day someone had asked me, well, if you could do anything in aviation, what would that be? And I thought to myself, gosh, I would love to get into an airplane and talk to young boys and girls who don't think that they have a future in aviation and inspire them to consider it. Um, and in this journey, you know, I grew up terribly shy. I'm one of six girls. I have five sisters. Um, so just... I struggled a lot with confidence. And so when I decided I wanted to fly around the world, there was a handful of people that were really encouraging, but there was also a handful of people who just doubted me and, and thought it was a bit of a joke. Um, and so when I got connected with Wendy, she had offered for me to be able to go visit Jerry, that she would make that connection. And I have to say, I showed up to Jerry's doorstep, still just you know not very confident. And when I told her of my plans, she looked me straight in the eye and she said, I believe in you. And that was all that I needed to hear to put any doubt aside. And um, again, she's the reason why I'm here, uh, because she believed in me and, and just gave me so much um, confidence that I could do this. That's great. You know, it's just such an interweaving of, of things and passing on from generation to generation. It's just really cool. Wendy, I wanted to ask you, you kind of mentioned this, but what prompted you to reprint her book? So you kind of mentioned that. And what was it like just going through all of those in her home? And, and, and you know, how did she handle all that? When we first were introduced to Jerry and said, wow, where's the book? we got to read the book. And uh, Susan said, well, it's uh, very expensive. Uh, it's very hard to get. As Shasta, the, as Shasta said, when she, she couldn't afford the book, she, that's because it, the, it had been printed in 1970. There were only 1,000 copies. And at that point, they ran $350 to $650 online. So it was no little paperback to get. So to... Because my background is in publishing, but have a, with a love of a, aviation, that was just the perfect fit. And so we we asked Jerry for the opportunity to print to work with her to reprint the book. We did learn that some other people had worked on it in that in in the interim that hadn't ever completed it. But we when we went down there and spent time with her again. She loved aviation, she loved pilots, she preferred pilots, and she loved to talk about flying and that kind of stuff. She didn't like a lot of uh, silly little trivia nonsense. She liked really meaty kinds of discussions. And she also was a night owl at that point. So we were up until 2 o'clock in the morning um, talking and taking pictures, and she had an entire room full of this documentation. And I remember I was there with Dale, my partner, 
partner, and he had a copy stand, and he was taking the photos, and I would say, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, look at this, look at this, why, 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 here's the gas receipt, or, oh, my goodness, why, here's how much something cost here or there, and he would say, just keep putting it in there, we've got to keep taking the pictures. The room was full of the documentation, and we were just desperate to preserve it and to capture it, and, and it really wasn't until we got back home and were able to, to put things like this together and look at them chronologically and, and, and imagine the additional value that that would add for both for pilots and for the regular reader to see things like a weather chart that looks like this, things that's nothing at all like what it is today, and, and we could really that much more appreciate what that kind of accomplishment was. So, it, again, it's just such an honor, Dorothy, I mean, to be there, to be with her, and, and we were so glad and grateful that all of that documentation still existed at that time and that we had the chance to capture it and be able to share it. Yeah, the fuel prices have changed yes. a bit. <laughs> Shasta, what was your first thought above a round-the-world flight? When did you really first think about that? So that's a great question. Um, at Embry-Riddle, um, so I grew up predominantly in a very women uh, environment. I have a lot of aunts, sisters, cousins. We're all women. Um, so it's a bit of a shock for me to go to Embry-Riddle and look around and see a lot of guys. It just didn't feel very natural for me. And I kept hearing, you know, there needs to be more women in the industry. Um, at the time, when I was a student, our university president launched an initiative called the Women's Initiative. And his goal really was, let's all get together, students, staff, um, and talk about how could we bring in more women, um, both faculty and students, to the university. And uh, at the time I was a grad student, I was just a participant. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I've been a big sister, you know, my whole life. and. Um, you know, for my family, again, English was our third language, and my parents um, didn't know very much about the uh, educational system here. So it was a lot of my older sister and I figuring it out and passing that knowledge down to our younger uh, sisters. And so I saw how much of a difference that made. Um, so I, I, I remember at the end of the summit at Embry-Riddle, this Women Initiative Summit, um, I went home and I typed up a draft of what now is called the Women's Ambassadors Program. And essentially what it was is um, current students being big sisters to the incoming freshman class. And um, luckily the university president approved it and uh, I started it and launched it. And within two years of this program um, being out there, the female enrollment at the Daytona Beach campus went from 12% to 22%. So that was really cool to see that this little idea that I had, which was quite simple, made this big impact on our, on our campus. And that really planted the seed of like dreaming big. And um, when it came to just figuring out what I wanted to do with my pilot career, I just kept going back to, I want there to be impact, I want, to be a big sister to a lot of these young kids that are not sure. Um, and I think that's really where the seed was planted and it just came together to this idea of flying around the world, meeting young kids, talking to them about careers in aviation. Um, so yeah, that's where it started. Okay, um, let's see. I think you mentioned at one point, uh, Shasta, that you had this thing called an imposter syndrome. Do you want to explain that? <laughs> of course. Well, I had a couple things against me. Um, no one in my family was in aviation. Um, I didn't come from a family where we had a lot of resources. Um, I'm a woman. <laughs> uh, I come from a different background. So it just all of these things made it really hard. It gave me a lot of uh, headwind pursuing a career in aviation. and. I couldn't help but feel like I was an imposter when I would walk into the the room of a conference or even in class. Like no one had, none of my friends, none of my classmates had this very different background. And I just felt like the black sheep and so many times I would question, how am I gonna survive in this industry? Is there room for me? Um, and I, but I was a big dreamer, obviously. Uh, and I have to say, I, taking it back to Jerry, 
She just gave me so much confidence. She didn't even blink when I had told her of my plans of flying around the world. And when she um, told me that I was going to do it, and then she started to ask me questions, I just felt more confident. And I remember even after meeting her, I went to a conference and I thought to myself, I shouldn't have imposter syndrome because no one can tell me that I cannot fly around the world because the one woman who did told me that I can. So that's that's really all I need. Um, so yeah, imposter syndrome is, is, is very real, uh, but what helps is talking to experts who've done what you wanna do, who can empower you or give you some advice on your journey. Yeah. Um, Wendy, I just wanted to ask you when, I guess, she contacted you, then you contacted Jerry? That's right. And what did she think about another young woman coming along like that? Well, I'm going to say, actually, it was Shasta's boyfriend. Ah. Oh. It was. Now her fabulous husband and the father of her children. And um, so he's the one that really reached out first. I think it might have been secretly. I don't know. If, and 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 so he he was going to get this book and 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 help uh, help make this connection. But then when we got to to know that it was Shasta, we said, "Oh, you can't possibly talk to this woman on the phone. Not good enough. You must meet her in person." And we knew because she's so welcoming. She she didn't have an interest in other people not doing what she had done. She wanted other people to do what she had done. She wanted all of us to do what she had done, if you wanted. And so her door was open, and and she was eager to speak to uh, Shasta and to be inspired by her. So th that, though, was the kind of thing that said um, made it so special for me. I'm a designer, right? I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm. I'm not yet a pilot. I'm only a student pilot. Um, I, we do have a plane. My partner's a pilot. But to be with folks like Shasta and Jerry was such big accomplishments and such big dreams. So for me, just being able to connect these people one to another was just a huge gift. And then to be able to watch Shasta go on and do it because there she did. She she went. Ahead Ahead and flew around the world while all of us who had been watching her come up uh, got to watch her as well. And so a lot of those same people who, who loved and supported Jerry and her story then got to follow Shasta and love and support her story too. And I, I want to add as well that when we early on met Shasta, we, after Jerry had passed, after the 50th anniversary of her flight, we had the great honor of assisting in spreading her ashes uh, with a plane painted exactly to match her plane. And she lived in Florida, and so we did that in Florida, and Shasta joined us in that plane. And that's the plane in the front there that's um, painted to exactly match Jerry's plane. And then the plane behind that was fitted with a special aerial ash dispersal patented system, and we were the third plane uh, capturing that. And to have Shasta with us, to truly pass the torch. She was the only person, I think, in the whole world that would have gotten the reason she was there, and she totally did. And she said, this is just the greatest thing ever, and she took that torch and she ran with it. So to every single thing that we've had the opportunity to, to be connected with just flourished in this beautiful woman. Shasta, did you do anything specific to honor Jerry on your flight? Absolutely. Um, you know, after I met Jerry Mock, I quickly realized that a lot of people didn't know who she was or the impact that she had. Um, and after I read her book, 3-8 Charlie, I was so beside myself. Like, here is this woman from Columbus, Ohio, uh, housewife, has three kids. Um, she's just a great writer. One day she was just tired of doing her household chores and looked up and told her husband, I'm going to fly around the world. You know, I want to do this. I want to go see the world. Um, and the fact that she did it back then, which was so difficult, um, and she did it all in a dress, which that was another <laughs> aspect of impression which she for me. hated. Right. <laughs> yeah, she would have preferred her pants. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I just, I, I wanted people to, 
at least with, if they were following my trip, to at least know this incredible woman who I'm literally following her footsteps. Um, so I made it a point to take off in the first stop on this around the world trip uh, for it to be Columbus, Ohio, um, and, and to honor this incredible woman. And I have to say, there was that picture of us spreading Jerry's ashes over the ocean. That moment, to be a part of that ceremony, was I was so honored. But I remember as we were spreading those ashes, I looked out into the Atlantic Ocean and I thought to myself, Jerry, uh, it's very comforting to know that you're here. You know, uh, we're spreading your ashes across this ocean because I'm going to cross this ocean one day and I'm going to remember you. And sure enough, along my journey, I had something happen over the Atlantic Ocean that caused me to turn around and do an emergency landing. Um, and I truly, honestly felt like she was there with me as this emergency was happening. And I just, I kept thinking about this day and how, you know, she was there with me. Um, it just, it was very powerful. Uh, but yeah, dedicating the first leg of this incredible trip to her uh, is how I wanted to start this incredible journey. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> Wendy, what do you hope people take away from Jerry's story? What Jerry wanted you to take away from it is that you too can accomplish anything that's in in your dream, anything difficult or challenging. She did enjoy inspiring young ladies, but she really just in, wanted to inspire everyone. And in particular, she wanted to inspire people to be interested in aviation and the technology fields that would support it. Even 50 years ago, she said in, in one of her very uh, more... Uh, specific quotes, she said, I want you to remember the little pilot while our world is moving into the jet age. And I think that is still so important today because um, it's, it's, it's so exciting to see her plane in the, this new general aviation gallery because that was a love of hers, not just aviation, but general aviation, our ability to fly and We'll lose that if we don't continue to learn and grow and educate new pilots and continue to utilize that right and opportunity that we have because regulations continue to limit all of those things. So I think that uh, Jerry was always saying to follow your dreams. You can do anything that you put your heart to, but also don't forget the little pilot. You know, she commented in her book, I always thought it was interesting about all the rules and regulations that she found flying around the world and how lucky we are here in the United States. We think, and we are getting more regulations, there's no doubt about it, but it was still something that really resonated with her. Not to mention that every time she landed, there were a lot of people waiting with rules and regulations and wanting some, you know, some outlays of cash and things like that so that she could get started again. So, yeah, she really realized what we have back here in the States. Um, let me ask each of you this. Who are your other aviation heroes? Well, certainly... Um, Every, we have to love Amelia Earhart. We just have to. And and <laughs> and even though um, her sister Susan and I, our first question always is, you know, who was the first woman to fly around the world? No, it wasn't her, <gasps> right? Because so many people do think it was Amelia. And so a lot of times we're saying, no, 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 it wasn't her. But Amelia Earhart did uh, break a lot of uh, barriers, open the door for everyone, and um and, and opened the door for Jerry. Jerry was very inspired, inspired by Amelia Earhart. She did watch her journey, and it was an interest of hers even until her death. She was interested also in following um, all of those uh, stories of folks that were looking for her. But also, I, I live in Ohio. I gotta love all these Ohio folks, the record setters, um, astronauts. Um, all of those folks are the folks that I really love in aviation as well. Okay, Shasta. Wow, it's such a hard question to answer because you have these great aviators, Charles Lindbergh, Chuck Yeager, Wiley Post, Amelia Earhart. Um, I mean, the list goes on. I, I feel like now that I'm learning more about women aviators, I'm so impressed. Um, I feel like their stories were lost, but if you go back to the Wright brothers, women were there pay, helping the Wright brothers pave the way like the Wright brothers' sister. 
Um, and I'm just learning about these stories of, of women, Bessie Coleman, that are just so inspiring. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to how their stories are being retold and highlighted and, and surfaced. Um, but, you know, I, I, Amelia Earhart is great. We all have learned about her in one way or another. Uh, it's a very common name. But I always felt this very great sense of connection with Jerry's story, maybe because she was a housewife. She was very different. Um, I grew up aspiring to be a housewife because that's what my mother was and generations before her. Um, but it wasn't until the back end of my trip when I was in Hawaii, I was stuck because of mechanical issues. And of course, the weather wasn't cooperating. Um, and I just kept getting an Uber from my hotel to the airport back and forth. And one day, um, this Uber driver was like, you have to go to this memorial of Amelia Earhart, um, which is in Hol Honolulu, Hawaii. And I remember going there and looking out, and I, again, I felt this strong connection to Amelia Earhart. I really, truly felt like she was there with me. Um, and, and I just thought, like, these women are so incredible, and they inspired me throughout my trip in different ways. And I, I just really am excited to hear their stories resurface and for us to learn more about them. Good. Um, I just want to mention that during our Q&A, uh, we are going to, we have a microphone that's set up here uh, in the, uh, the planetarium, so please you can come forward to it and we'll get alerted uh, for you having a question. And for those online, please submit your uh, questions to the chat and we'll get to uh, as many of them as we can. Um, Shasta, what made you interested in aviation in the first place? I kind of um, mentioned it earlier. I, I really struggled with like, who am I? Where do I belong? I felt like I was never Afghan enough for the people in Afghanistan. And I, I certainly didn't feel American enough either because when I was younger, I had really short, dark hair, very tan skin. Um, and I just, I struggled with fitting in. Um, but there was something about being in the air where I just, I just knew this is it. This is where I belong. Wherever this plane is taking me, that's where I'm going and that's where I need to be. Um, and it just, and I think the reason for that is, is when you're flying, it's such an unbiased environment. The airplane doesn't know if you're a man or a woman, what your background is, where you come from. That airplane is going to fly based on your ability to pilot it to wherever you want to go. And just ha having that unbiased environment really just allowed me to put down my guard and just be in the moment. Um, and so I think that's what it is. It's, it truly is freedom for me to be who I am, to show up as I am, and be in this environment that's going to take me to these really exciting destinations. Um. You mentioned that you had some challenges, you know, uh, with weather and this and that. You know, what kind of, is there any other challenges during the flight that really stand out to you? Or, or maybe you can correlate with, with, Jer with Jerry and her flight? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I remember I once was asked when I landed, where's the pilot? <laughs> because, of course, a woman cannot be flying this plane by herself. Um, you know, and I know Jerry, too. Uh, and it's interesting because in some countries, when I would um, park the plane, like they just felt uncomfortable, like they had to come and help me because I wasn't capable or, you know, just doing my pre-flight checklist. People, yeah, I would have men come up to me and they're like, do you want us to help you? You know, and it was just very interesting to see, to see that. Um, and I know that Jerry, her trip was so quick. She kind of... Uh, had a timeline. Her husband was very eager for her to get back. She had kids at home. Um, so I know her trip was really quick, uh, but she was also very real. In her book, she talks about wanting to get her hair done. I remember I thought the same thing. I'm like, I need a haircut. Where, where do I go? Um, so yeah, there, there were some similarities, um, but it was just very interesting to see people's reaction uh, with me landing at like Dubai International Airport coming out of this plane and it's not what they expect, you know? 
Um, so yeah. I'm sure she witnessed that during her trip too. Well, if we go back to that image of her standing by the plane with the two gentlemen, that was one of those moments uh, when she was in Saudi Arabia and uh, she got out of the aircraft and everyone cheered. And of course it was all um, a whole male gathering there. And then they all kind of just stopped and there was this kind of tension and what's happening next. And finally, I believe it was the gentleman on the left there who went and looked in the airplane and came back over and said, there's no man. There was no man in there with her. She flew there by herself. And the place just, you know, they could not believe it that this woman had come there solo by herself in 1964. Um, let's see. Looking back on your flight today, would you do anything differently? Probably um, just have more confidence in myself. You know, like I look back at the pictures and I do look very confident, but there are many moments where I realize how real it was to be like 14 hours into a flight completely by yourself, like no sign of life, not a bird, not like a whale, nothing. And you're out there and you're like, oh my goodness, I only have one engine like, even if my plane goes down, it would be hours until someone would, you know, even find me. Um, but just having confidence. If you have that mission within yourself that you want to accomplish something, believe it through and through. You know, even if things happen, never let go of your conviction that this is going to happen. Um, at no point did I not think the trip was going to, like, not happen. But I, I knew things were, like, going to come up that would throw me off or um, challenge me. Um, so just to be more confident. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the torch has been passed forward still. Shasta, you also already mentioned Zara Rutherford, I believe, who became the youngest one to f woman to fly after you and the youngest person in the world for, what, about nine months and a year until her brother came and had to do better. We won't talk about that. <laughs> but Jerry, uh, Jerry's approach and support through Shasta, it's still making an, an impact now. So, you know, what is your next, I guess, goal on that or other? You know, I know your, your organization is trying to make the impact to bring others into aviation. Yeah, so it was really interesting. Um, Zara contacted me, I think it was through LinkedIn, and she said, hi, my name is Zara, I'm from Belgium. I wanna fly around the world and um, we set up a Zoom call for uh, some time out from that initial message, and I thought a lot about what am I going to say to Zara? Um, so my trip actually took five years to plan to raise the fundraising, and it wasn't just me going around the world. It was um, we worked with several different organizations, including ICAO, where during the stops um, that I would be stopping in, we would have some form of an outreach event where kids either come to the airport or I go to them and I talk to them about careers in aviation. Um, so in that five-year span, I got so much advice about flying around the world, mo mainly from people who've never done it, but... Um, <laughs> I just thought, like, what would, she, what, like, what can I offer her that's going to be of value? And I took myself back to that day when I met Jerry Mock, and Jerry certainly never told me you should or you need to, or it felt like her, um, her whole uh, demeanor about this news was just, it was so supportive. And she, she didn't say, oh, um, you know, make sure you do it this way. It, it, she just made sure that if I ever ran into any issues that I could reach out to her and, and she would be there to help. So I, I took that and I really applied it to me giving Zara some feedback. And I said, Zara, you're going to do this. You are going to inspire more people than I have. And, you know, like, I'm always here for you at any point of the trip, no matter what the time of day is, call me. Because um, if anyone knows a little bit of how you're feeling, it's probably me. And it's not easy. It takes a toll on you. Um, and luckily, I had the chance to meet Zara during her Around the World trip. And it was so cool to just talk to her, hug her, wish her well. Um, but but Jerry really inspired that conversation that I had with with Zara and how I just approached that mentorship with her. And 
now uh, in phase two, you know, so my nonprofit Dream Soar, it was all about go out there in the world and inspire young people to get into aviation. And I have to say, through that trip, I got to meet with 10,000 kids face to face. It was so real. Like these young people would come up to me, tell me about their ambitions to get into aviation. They would tell me their names, where they were from. And I just remember when the trip ended, I kept thinking, like, I need to do something with this. Like, you know, th these are a lot of kids that came up to me, opened up. And so our nonprofit Dream Store, we took a lot of time to think about what's next for us. Um, we launched a scholarship program at Embry-Riddle, and we were so honored to give out a scholarship to a young woman there in the flight program. But we thought, you know, the hardest part is, is um, it's not inspiring people to get into aviation. It's the what's next. And so our nonprofit is working on building a digital hub. So no matter where you are in the United States, if you have an interest in aviation, there is this one-stop shop hub where you can go to learn about the industry, the different career paths, the resources, all of that. It's a big undertaking, but we truly believe that this is what's needed in the industry. And this is what's going to do right by all of those amazing people that we saw around the world. Hmm. Speaking of around the world, which is what we're doing, um, how was your flight different from Jerry's? And what were your roots? Were your roots were dim uh, quite different or similar? I have to say, Jerry was so much more ambitious with her route. She flew a lot over like large stretches of water, uh, uh, over oceans and deserts. Um, her goal was, I need to do this quickly and in the short amount of distance. For me, on the other hand, I wanted to have an impact, so I had more stops. It was a total of 30 outreach events that we did around the world. Um, so, and mine, of course, because of these events, took longer. I think Jerry's was like around 29 days. Mine's was 145 days. Um, I encountered weather, uh, three weather systems, two mechanical issues. Um, but she, I mean, her plane does not fly nearly fast as my plane. And her plane is a lot more cramp. And she had like a typewriter in there, which I, her weight and balance must have been so, <laughs> so wild. Um, but yeah, she, I'm still so like amazed by what she was able to accomplish. And she was so brave to f fly over such large stretches of water um, and to do it in such a short amount of time. And to do it in a dress, too. That was, you know, I still <laughs> can't get back over to that. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, she felt that, that yeah, I mean, I, I guess from the beginning, she thought she was going to go quickly. And then when Joan Merriman Smith uh, also signed on to fly around the world at the same time, Jerry had gone to the FAA first and had the actual um, sanction to do it. But Joan was still going to go. Joan was a, a well-known pilot of, for the 99s in that group. And so when she announced, then it was a little bit of a horse race there uh, to, to do it. And so that kept her going as well. Um, and I think, you know, Joan ended up coming in, you know, almost a month later, I guess. So, uh, but, you know, she did a fantastic job. And, and she went the equatorial route route to match Earhart's and, and won the Harmon Trophy for that. So, you know, it, it's interesting that it wasn't just one. There were two women who actually independently, unknown to each other, did that at the same time. And Joan is in the history records of the second woman to fly around the world. Um, so, you know, both women did an incredible job yeah. given the circumstances and the time right. that that was in. Yeah. Um, let's see. I was going to ask... For both of you, I will start with Wendy. What projects do you have now, or is there any more, uh, anything new with Jerry Mock, or moving on to other things? Or well, if I'm allowed to give a shout out to our local a museum affiliate, uh, Jerry is from Newark, Ohio, and the museum in her hometown, the Works Museum, is opening a special gallery exhibit this Saturday that Susan will speak at, um, at the Works Museum in Newark, Ohio. And then Saturday, May 4th, we'll have a really special aviation and uh, Jerry Mock Day. Uh, that day, we have a special uh, um, 
a super piece of art by Ron Cole Aviation of Jerry flying around the world, and we hope to raise more awareness and, and inspire more children to get into the aviation uh, fields. I myself, my next project is they're waiting on me to get done with this so that I can help co-chair our local stop spot, um, our local stop for the ARC, the Air Race Classic. So that is a women's aviation race around the country, and they'll be stopping in the Newark Heath Airport, and so that'll be in June. So that's my next aviation uh, support tool. That's this June? It is. Oh, exciting. Okay, great. We always follow that. I remember going to the one when they left at Frederick years ago. Um, you next. Yeah, so I, I actually just had a baby two months ago, um, so I'm coming back from that whole maternity phase, and uh, really what I have lined up in the next coming months is doing more speaking engagements, and I always make it a point to talk about Jerry Mock, because there is no Shasta ways without Jerry Mock. Um, so just getting her story out there and uh, letting people know who this incredible woman is. Um, so I, I intend to continue to do that as I get in front of crowds and, and talk to people. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's see. What does it mean to both of you to see Jerry's plane here and her legacy here at the Smithsonian, the Air and Space Museum? I gotta say, it was it was really emotional to see it up there. I, I'm moved more than I had expected to be. Um, clearly, we're all inspired by Jerry. We we want more people to know her story. There's always been, as you know, Dorothy, as the curator of her piece, you know that there's. People want it everywhere. People in Columbus wanted it in the airport, and they made a whole campaign to do it. And those of us who love the Smithsonian and aviation said, we kind of said, oh, no, that's not what you want to do. You need to have that at the Smithsonian where the airplane people come. But everyone wants it in their yard, right? So um, it just was... Um, to see it back here and, and for you to have selected her plane, which is a Cessna, so it's just a rock solid model that so many people in general aviation fly anyway. But to combine that with the story of women in aviation and the first woman to fly solo around the world and to have that be a part of this general aviation exhibit, it's for Anybody that loves airplanes, we love the Udvarhazy. That, that's where we go. That's where lots and lots of airplanes are. But for those of us who want her story out, we're so glad to have it back here where more and more people will see her story and, and be inspired. So just moved uh, to see it here and uh, m more so than I thought. So I'm very grateful and excited. Thank you. You know, it's, it's quite emotional, to be very honest with you all, because this is the first time I've seen it. Um, I remember as a student at Embry-Riddle, we had the chance to travel to D.C. to do some work for the Women's Ambassadors Program. And I remember um, th there was a morning that we had off, and I made it a point to, like, get ready. I came out to the museum, to this specific one, and I was so disappointed to learn that her plane was not here. Um, it was at the other... Uh, National Air and Space Museum, and I, I just, I had so much hope to see it and to, for it to give me inspiration, um, but that chance never came, and then I recently moved to Virginia, um, and I went out to the other location, and I found out that the plane wasn't there, um, <laughs> so, but you know, the timing is so, it, it always makes me so shocked, because here I am in this new chapter of you know, motherhood, coming to Virginia, getting more connected to my aviation community and roots. And I truly think seeing her plane today just gives me so much more inspiration to keep going. To, you know, it doesn't stop with the trip around the world, my aviation adventures. I need to just keep going, keep spreading her incredible story to many people. Um, but it, it's emotional because it's giving me a lot of inspiration that I feel like I need as a new mom, as a new person in this, to this community. Um, so it's, it's, it's really special. Looking back on your flight today, would you do anything differently? That's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I mean, we all have our different stories of doing things and minds happen the way that it was supposed to. Um, and I just, 
I'm so grateful that I truly had this opportunity that only a handful of women have had. Like, I remember being across the Atlantic Ocean and I reached my point of no return. And I thought, like, this is it. I'm committed. I'm going to the Azores. And I had this moment where I realized in the history of aviation, only seven women at that point had ever crossed this ocean in a single engine airplane. And I was like, who would have thought the eighth woman would be this awkward, shy person I'm describing myself like this person who just had no ties to aviation whatsoever, you know, barely got into the industry like that person would be the eighth woman. Like I was so shocked. Um, and that just shows that goes to show that it, you know, achieving your dreams, it doesn't matter, you know, where you're from, where where you're going, um, like what your background is. Dreams are for everybody. So just put everything you have into it, go for it. And who knows, you could be across, flying across the Atlantic Ocean in a single engine airplane wondering the same thing. Um, so I wouldn't change anything. And I want to add, too, as someone who did get to see one of Shasta's events that was full of children, that whereas in, you know, when Jerry was flying, she was focused on flying around the world, getting there quickly, getting there safely. Shasta layered on all of these other objectives of not just being the youngest woman, which she was, but really inspiring, not just even inspiring people uh, through her story, but engaging with children. At every stop, she had things planned. There were young people who came to the airport and to be able to see that at the stop in Columbus where uh, one of the you know for first the takeoff spot it really she was able to do that she, all of this beauty and enthusiasm really translated to kids and to see their faces and to see them inspired is just full circle it really was Dorothy I have a question for you if oh. that's okay okay <laughs> <laughs> um, with you curating this exhibit, is there anything that you learned about Jerry that has stuck out to you? Oh, just, you know, what a remarkable woman she was. I, I'm a little older and I can remember women of that era and my mother and women who didn't have a lot of opportunity and they were basically housewives. And she was a bored housewife. There's no doubt about it. She loved her children. Everything was good, but she wanted to do something else. And so, you know, just learning that she went ahead and just knocked it out and said, I'm going to go do this, which was very remarkable for the 1960s, for sure. So, and yeah, I learned a lot. And I've spoken with her on the phone, and she was always very meticulous about, you know, what's going on with the airplane and, you know, everything. She, she kept that through her life. And uh, we always talked about you know some of the different incidences and that sort of thing and uh, we've got a, p a picture here this is a, a fun story you know we had she our we have had the thing called the Be a Pilot Day, and it's now Innovations Day uh, out at the Udbar Hazi Center. And we invite people to fly in in their airplanes, and then we open it up to the public. And so uh, the gentleman here in this picture, Vince Massimini, and some of the other docents wanted her to come up because they were enthralled with her story as well. And so she said, well, I'll come, but someone has to fly me. I don't fly in commercial aircraft. So because that's who she was. And so Vince said, okay, I will come and get you. So this, uh, he flew down to Florida in his small aircraft, single engine, small aircraft, which she felt extraordinarily comfortable in, picked her up and flew her back up. Uh, and they landed back out at this air park uh, just across the Eastern shore. And sh she just had a marvelous time flying up with him. And you know, they had to dodge a few th storms. A bunch of us were waiting to take her to dinner because we wanted to take her to the local restaurant and when she arrived she popped out of the plane and just said I'm ready for my crab cake <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun she I so she had a real spirit she and I just every time I talked with her uh, you know it was just finding out something new that wasn't in the book or you know cajoling her into maybe you know sending me some more information for our files and things like that uh, but she, she enjoyed coming up and she really enjoyed 
being with the people that day. And we had families that were stopping by to talk with her. They were just in awe that she had done this. And as you can see, she's a tiny woman. And so here is an, a pilot, I believe he was with Northwest, and he just got a kick out of her. And he would talk, talk, talk. And then I basically had to say, now let's let someone else get in. And, <laughs> and so then he would go away. And then there, you know, she'd talk to children or other uh, people in the in the uh, in the area you know, who were coming back to sit with her, and and then he'd pop back in as soon as they did. So uh, she was very engaging and just had this great personality to talk aviation. That day. I mean, she was just terrific with that. It was a great day, and uh, we really enjoyed hosting her. And that was the only time she came. We'd hoped she would be able to come back, but uh, that it was just terrific. Um, so let's see. Oh, what we're gonna, one more question or two here. Um, there was a question that I saw earlier um, about aircraft. You know, she flew in a Cessna 180 in the 60s, well before GPS and all of that. And, but we know how diligently she planned for it and that she was, you know, she knew what she was doing. And I know that you did the same thing. You had a, a slightly more modern, but not necessarily, Bonanza. Um, but you had a lot more equipment and that sort of thing. So do you feel still like you'd made the challenges like she did, but, you know, you wished, do you think she would have enjoyed flying in the plane, you know, with the equipment that you had? So, um, gosh, what she did is... I can't even, I would never attempt to fly around the world if I didn't have GPS. <laughs> I'm just going to be very honest. Um, I, you know, my my aircraft wasn't as sophisticated. I didn't have like the nice Garmin G1000 that I trained with. It was my six pack and a G Garmin G450 and 550. Um, but I mean, I had Jeppesen charts. I had an iPad. I had the Garmin pilot app that helped me navigate around the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I said, I would not have attempted to fly around the world had I not had GPS. So I really don't know if you can compare what she did with what I did. Um, but yeah, I give it up to all of those aviators that, that flew before GPS. It's quite <laughs> impressive. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, you mentioned some challenges in your flight, in your plane, and we just talked about how it was more advanced, but um, how did your problems and your challenges differ um, in any other ways? Or do you think, you know, in, in some ways, did you feel like you were just following her in her flight and, and you could feel that, that, you know, it was a very similar flight in that regard? Um, it was it was similar in the sense that we both had this mission of we want to circumnavigate the globe. We want to see different exciting locations and meet new people. Um, but, you know, Jerry, she, again, she had a timeline. It was very specific. She was in competition with someone else. Um, it was very much go, 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 uh, which I can only imagine how fatigued she was after this trip because at least I had a chance to go to a destination, do an outreach event, then go to my hotel and rest. Um, and when the weather was bad, we didn't take any chances. I, you know, I would make the final call and say, not today. Um, but, you know, I had interesting <laughs> experiences. Um, so over the Atlantic Ocean, my HF radio snaps off the plane and I all of a sudden lose all communications with air traffic control and I just remember thinking this is a 28 foot cable and I just envisioned it hitting my propeller and jamming it and there I go um, so that was really scary and uh, later on I found out that Jerry had some issues with her HF radio when she took off from Columbus uh, which was really interesting but um, this sounds wild, but I encountered head lice, uh, I, I think, in India. Um, so it, it was so tough flying the plane in this crazy heat, um, crossing the intertropical conversion zone, dodging thunderstorms, scratching my head. Like, it was so bizarre <laughs> to me. Um, and I couldn't find lice medication until I got to Hawaii. It was, it was so crazy. Um, and then, like... I took off from Honolulu, Hawaii to cross the longest leg of the trip, was from, which was from Hawaii to California. 
And I just remember it was a very heavy takeoff that I did. I mean, I was nursing the plane up to altitude. It was it was flying about 50 feet per minute, climbing at 50 feet per minute, sorry. Um, and I just remember three hours into the flight, I kept looking at the winds and I'm like, I have a zero knot uh, wind component and I had anticipated on having some tailwind and I just, I kept doing the math and I, I thought, I'm not going to make it to California. Like I could risk it and hope that I do get some um, tailwinds, but I had to turn the plane around, do an overweight landing and I just felt so tired and like defeated. I just wanted the trip to be done. Um, and that's when I went to the Amelia Earhart Memorial and it just revived me. Um, so I had a lot of, of these challenges that maybe Jerry had too, but she didn't really express in the book. But a, a trip of this caliber in a small aircraft by yourself, single engine, things are going to happen. Um, and you know, in hindsight, I, I'm grateful for them because they just made my my experience. I, I come out of it more resilient and more experienced as a pilot. But um, it certainly it was similar, but very different. Mm -hmm. The two trips. I want to add too that at, you mentioned about Joan Miriam Smith flying, and and Joan Miriam Smith, even though she and Jerry were not considering it a race, the the Columbus Dispatch and those folks watching it were considering it a race. And her husband. And her husband. And <laughs> and Jerry was in a, a single engine and Joan was in a twin engine. And um, so while that means more power, it's also more things to break. And they did. And so I don't I think that because Jerry was she was a techie for her age, had she been availed of more technology, I'm sure she would have used it and used it well. But she sure didn't miss it, right? And she, at one point in uh, the story, you can read that she learned that her compass was off. And she, she, she made it to the next place and the next place is, which is almost not humanly possible. I don't even know how you do that. But she did. And she, once she got the, the compass uh, checked out, it was 10 degrees off. And so if you imagine flying across the ocean with a, your compass 10 degrees off it uh she was just a really cool cucumber and she could uh she could deal with those kinds of things so she probably could have dealt with more technology but i don't think she missed it she didn't need it she didn't need it <laughs> well this has been really exciting um i just you know want to say that we've enjoyed hearing from both of you i want to remind the audience here in the planetarium that the thomas w haas uh, we All Fly Gallery will be open after this, so you can all go and see Jerry's plane. Um, and I want to thank so much uh, to all of you, Wendy Shasta, to Jerry's sister for being here, uh, Susan Reed, and uh, thanks also to GE Aerospace for their generous support of the Aviation Lecture Series. And you can find more programs on the events page, uh, such as our upcoming lecture in May. So I, I really enjoyed this back and forth with you, and I, we're so pleased that you came. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.